Monsignor, happy Easter. Oh, the same to you and to yours. Thank you. Could you start off by telling us why Easter is so important to Christians? Well, it's absolutely central because there would have been no Christian church and no Christians if Easter hadn't happened. So what we have is a bunch of defeated um, and pessimistic uh, and despairing people after Good Friday who are then on Easter Day itself just transformed into a world-changing force. And uh, well, people know the rest of the story, how the Christian faith um, without any power or worldly authority or arms changed the whole world um, in those first centuries. Uh, so without Easter, that simply would not have happened. Well, absolutely. And obviously we are celebrating Easter now, but not everyone who is a Christian celebrates at this time of year. The Orthodox, for example, will be celebrating later on. Which is actually the day of Christ's resurrection? Yes, well, Easter is actually calculated quite simply. It's the, um, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Right. Uh, but the, uh, the Orthodox, of course, follow a different calendar from the Western calendar, which is 13 days behind, I think, at the moment. It'll probably fall back further behind as time goes on. Um, so that's one reason for the difference in um, dates. But the other uh, also, which is a very good reason, is that they insist that uh, Easter for them should never fall before the Passover because it was at the time of the Passover that mm. Jesus had the Last Supper with his friends and when he was arrested and tried and crucified. So that makes some sense what they say, but that's the reason it's different. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, what did Jesus do between Good Friday and Easter Sunday? And why is that important? Well, he said to the good thief, didn't he? The thief who repented on the cross at the last minute, as it were, he said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Mm. So we know that he was doing that. Uh, we also know from other parts of the New Testament that he was preaching uh, to those souls that had gone before, uh, from the very beginning, as it were, and who were waiting for him to come and to bring the fullness of salvation to them. And that uh, also is uh, a sign of hope for us uh, regarding those who have gone before us. The sovereignty of the risen Christ is not just about this world and this life, but everywhere and at all times. So would it be fair to say that he opened the gates of heaven? He opens the gates of heaven to all believers, as the Te Deum says. Mm. Um, and that means uh, everyone who believes in him of all ages. Absolutely. Uh, why would you say that charity is one of the theological virtues and how does that relate to Easter? Charity is love. I mean, that's um, one translation of, of the word that is used of agape uh, in the New Testament. It, primarily, it stands for God's love. God's love for us uh, in the coming of Jesus, uh, in his life, his teaching, uh, his work of feeding and healing. Uh, most of all, most importantly, in his uh, suffering and dying for us. Um, so the resurrection is God's seal of approval on all that Jesus has done. And all that he has done is nothing but love. Mm. Uh, so God is love. Uh, what we see in Jesus is love. Um, the Christian faith is love. Uh, but um, it is love of a certain kind of God's love for us, even when we were his enemies uh, and not his friends, to make us his friends. And um, God's love has also provided um, for different kinds of love in the human family. You know, there is the love that there is between families, within families, and then there is the love of friends, and then there's the love between a man and a woman that leads to the establishing of a family, uh, which is the basis of all community and society. Uh, and then of course there's God's love. Um, so um, Easter uh, reminds us of God's love that makes 
all love, all good love possible. Love, of course, like anything else in human experience can also go wrong. But um, God's love is about setting love right along with everything else. And what would you say it means when people say that God is love? Well, it's not just people, it's the Bible says that God is love. I think that means that the very, in the very nature of God, the love between the Father and the Son, the Son and the Father, uh, expressed in that overflowing love uh, by the Holy Spirit that brings about creation. Mm. I think what is meant is that um, God is characterized by love. He's also characterized by other things, so justice for instance, or compassion, uh, but certainly by love. Now, Pope Benedict died at the end of last year and he founded the Ordinary Act, which you're a part of. Yes. How will you remember him? Well, I have um, many memories of him. Uh, he once said to me, um, he said, I hear you know some Catholic theology. <laughs> and the first thing that came to my mind uh, was not as much as your holiness, I said, <laughs> which is a bit cheeky. Um, a very great theologian, uh, not just that, but I think one who really understood the cultural and historical situation in Western Europe, uh, or in Europe generally. We need people like that. Uh, he debated with others, existentialists, agnostics, atheists, about the situation in Europe uh, with great respect for them, and they had great respect for him. So I think the church needs people like that who stand at that interface. Um, and of course, um, in understanding the situation in Europe, he also knew that almost every value that Europe holds most dear uh, has to do ultimately with the Christian faith and with the Christian estimate of the human condition. Here, here. Uh, Pope Benedict was also known for his emphasis on orthodoxy and Christian tradition, which is ultimately a focus on Jesus. Mm. Do you think churches in the West are losing sight on this focus on Jesus? And if so, why? For example, do you draw a distinction between what's going on in the Church of England and the Catholic Church, with an example being the German bishops uh, versus the C of E, both voting to bless same-sex marriages or same-sex couples? Some people would suggest this is a good thing. What are your, what's your take on it? Well, that's a very long and complicated <laughs> question, but <laughs> um, uh, the focus on Jesus. Well, uh, Pope Benedict, I mean, to go back to him for a moment, uh, uh, wrote uh, very um, uh, well and illuminatingly on, on Jesus of Nazareth, mm. uh, where he, uh, in one part of his work, concentrates on Jesus as the new Moses. Uh, who brings the renewed uh, law, the renewed Torah uh, to the people. I think that is right because what Jesus was doing was not inventing something new, but was telling people about what God had done in the past and the inner meaning of it. Mm -hmm. So not just the outward observance, and the ritual or whatever it might be, but the inner meaning of, of the law. And the inner meaning of the law has to do with how we are and how the world is. So Jesus teaching, for example, on parents and children, uh, or on marriage, uh, or on how we treat our neighbor, or indeed how we treat the stranger or the enemy. Uh, all of these have to do with God's law, which is not just arbitrary, uh, you know, this is right, that is wrong, but to do with how we are made, and how the world is made. To lose that focus, of course, means then uh, anything goes and uh, people can invent themselves or reinvent themselves in any way uh, that they like. That is not the way of Jesus. And if you lose that focus, um, then um, that is what happens. So, um, of course, uh, we are in a rapidly changing world. That's nothing new. I mean, the church has always been in a changing world. And the church needs to relate to that changing world, but it has to do so in a principled way. 
And that is where uh, the work of that great English saint, St. John Henry Newman is so important, is to show us how in a principled way we can relate um, to a changing world without abandoning uh, the scriptures and the great tradition of the church. I think uh, the temptation for progressive church people, as they may want to be called, is to be uh, entranced by the magic of the rapidly changing world, uh, but not to see uh, the riches of the great tradition, which they need to bring into engagement with that rapidly changing world. I think that is what is happening in some parts of Europe today, it, uh, that needs to be challenged to say, well, what are your principles for engagement? And I would, uh, as you might expect, take my stand with Newman to say it has to be principled, it has to conserve the nature of the gospel itself or what God has revealed. Um, it, there has to be continuity and also there has to be anticipation of the future so that uh, if you agree one thing, what else is going to happen next? Yes, the slippery slope. The slippery slope, indeed. So, and there is such a thing. So we should be in the world, but not of the world, whilst standing firm in the faith. Yes, uh, but uh, there has to be engagement. Mm. I mean, one of the great things about the Catholic tradition is uh, that there is positive engagement, the, uh, it is possible to see in the world, in culture, in history, in science, points of contact with Christian revelation. Mm. But this has to be done in a principled way rather than just capitulating yeah. to whatever is in fashion. Do you see a difference between what's happening with the German bishops and the Church of England? I think there is a difference. Uh, you mean the German bishops and the Catholic Church? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, the difference is, uh, first of all, um, that the Catholic Church knows how to make decisions um, that are of universal significance and to make them stick. I mean, there's a long history of that. The Church of England and the Anglican Communion, by their own admission, don't know how to do that. Secondly, there is a solid body of teaching, which goes back to the fathers, the councils, and indeed to scripture, uh, which is very difficult to overturn uh, in a single instance or by a, a few people, uh, whatever practices there may be here or there. And thirdly, of course, there's the possibility of the intervention uh, by the universal magisterium of the church, uh, embodied particularly in the Bishop of Rome, but also all bishops gathered with him. A very senior um, church leader with regard to what the Church of England had done, a Catholic church leader, uh, said to me, uh, I am so glad that we have a restraint on these matters from outside. It sounds like you're talking about authority, but are you concerned that the magisterium could be undermined by this new synodal approach that the Catholic Church is going through at the moment with a synod on synodality? Yeah, it could be, yes. I mean, that, that is possible. And I think this is why the synodal approach itself has to be a principled one. So, of course, the church and Catholics can't be against synods. There have been synods since the Council of Jerusalem, already in the New Testament, the great councils of the church that defined the faith of the church. They didn't invent the faith, but they defined it. Nicaea, uh, Constantinople, Chalcedon, Ephesus. Uh, but the, um, this has to be principled. So at the Council of Jerusalem already, what you have is the missionaries come back and say, some very exciting things are happening. The Gentiles are becoming Christian. What should we do? Should, do they have to become Jews first? So the church listens to them as a whole, and then the apostles decide what is to happen. And then once they have decided, they with the presbyters, the elders, and the whole church, they together decide how this news, this decision is to be communicated 
to the churches affected in Antioch and in other places. Now, I think that's quite a good model for a synod. So uh, a synod must be one that is a praying mm. synod. Uh, it must be focused on the Eucharist and on prayer generally. Uh, it must be um, a synod where there is an acknowledged differentiation. So of course, consult the faithful, the natural formations of the church at home, the particular church, in the, the bishop with his people uh, and um, also national churches, if you wish. Uh, but then the bishops have to decide what to do. That is their charism. That is what they're there for. Mm. Um, not just as administration and things like that, but the teaching of the church. And then there is the question of discipline. Once you've decided the teaching, what do you do about uh, making sure that this teaching is honored in the church. So all of those things are necessary. Um, from the very beginning, there have been experts who have helped the bishops. So, you know, Athanasius was not a bishop at Nicaea. He was a deacon who went with his bishop to help him. Uh, so the periti are important, but the bishops have a particular responsibility together with the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, to declare the faith of the church from time to time. Uh, to clarify it um, and um, to explain it to the faithful and to, and to the world. Mm. But they cannot change the faith of the church. So they can declare it, they can clarify it, they can explain it, but they mm. cannot change the faith of the church. So the task of a synod at any time is to relate that unchanging, once for all, uh, faith of the church to changing times. In the end, the bishops together, if they are gathered together, um, need to decide what is the teaching of the church. Together, of course, also with the Bishop of Rome, who has had a, has a particular charism in this matter. So at Chalcedon, you know, the, when there was a debate about uh, the nature of Jesus Christ himself, uh, it was the arrival of the tome of Leo that settled the matter. So we hope that'll be the case this time also. Okay, I'll pray for that. Let's pray for it. So Monsignor, how will we be celebrating Easter this year? Well, I will be in Pakistan um, where I'm going to do some teaching. Uh, so I will be celebrating with a persecuted um, church, heavily persecuted and great difficulty. Uh, need your prayers uh, for that. But one of the things that I do with the students I teach is to uh, take them through the events uh, of Holy Week uh, and enact them so they understand what actually happened. So how did Jesus have his Last Supper with his friends? Uh, it's not like the pictures um, sometimes depict, it's quite different. Um, what about his trials? I mean, the he had so many trials with, with the high priest and then the Sanhedrin uh, and then Pilate and then Herod and then Pilate again. And they were all, according to the laws of those people themselves, mistrials. So there was, apart from anything else, a miscarriage of justice. Mm. So the principles of Jewish law were not followed. The principles of Roman law were not followed. Um, and this sometimes people don't understand. Um, and then, of course, the horror of the crucifixion, uh, which we now understand better after films like The Passion of the Christ. Uh, the impossibility uh, of the resuscitation theory that he somehow revived in the cool of the tomb and walked away. I mean, if anyone's seen The Passion of the Christ, they will know this is impossible. Uh, the wonder of uh, what happened on Easter Day itself, uh, and the fact that the witnesses uh, were women uh, at first, uh, not the expected thing, mm -hmm. although he did appear to Simon, the first witnesses uh, were women uh, to the resurrection. All of that has to be made to come alive. Here, here. Well, thank you very much and God bless you. And you.